This is lecture five. In lecture four, we went over crossbridge cycling, so how sarcomeres shorten, and talked about the length tension relationship, in particular, active tension, uh, which is about uh, actin myosin crossbridge formation. And we talked about a few, not all, right, but a few explanations for force development. In this lecture, we'll cover the nervous system's recruitment of skeletal muscle, beginning in the brain in the motor cortex and ending at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, next lecture, we'll jump that junction and complete the contraction. But today, it's the motor cortices, right, cortexes, uh, what motor units are and how they behave, and we'll get into action potentials, how those work. Uh, let's start with the nervous system in general. Uh, this is your brain and nerves. It's a very complex network that sends signals from the brain all over the body and vice versa. It, it transmits messages from the periphery back to the brain for interpretation. And we categorize the parts of the nervous system as either central or peripheral. Central is your brain and spinal cord. Uh, so your central nervous system lives inside of your bones, inside of your skull, inside of your vertebrae. It's pretty well protected. Your peripheral nervous system is not so well protected. It's outside of the brain and spine, outside of the skull and spinal cord, the um, uh, vertebrae. And it goes pretty much everywhere else. Uh, I, I mean, there's no like nerves in your hair, but but pretty much uh, everywhere else in your body, uh, neurons are, are going. And the purpose of the peripheral nervous system is to relay information back and forth between the central nervous system and your peripheral meat, right? Your, your limbs and organs and other tissues. Um, within the peripheral branch, there's the autonomic nervous system. This is automatic control of stuff, blood pressure, heart rate, urination, uh, fight or flight things and breathing, digestion, a whole bunch of feedback loops, lots of regulatory things, both sympathetic and parasympathetic. That's the autonomic nervous system. And then there's a somatic nervous system. This is distinct from the autonomic system in that somatic isn't unconscious. It's voluntary. For the, for the most part, it's voluntary. We'll talk about involuntary-ish things like reflex arcs. Uh, those are in the somatic nervous system. But this is the branch of the peripheral nervous system that's responsible for muscle contraction. Voluntary muscle contraction happens here. And categorizing it as, as peripheral doesn't mean the brain isn't involved. Impulses for voluntary contraction originate in the motor cortex, which is in the brain. It's in the cerebral cortex, both hemispheres, right and left. Uh, and it's a it's a strip that's sort of like where headphones would go. Not the earbuds, but if you have headphones where the headband arches over your head, that's where the primary motor cortex lives in your brain. Uh, but there isn't just a primary motor cortex. There are other cortices involved in motor action, but we'll start with the primary motor cortex. It's the most important one in blue here. It's at the back end of the frontal lobe. Um, and there are neurons in this strip called Betz cells, B-E-T-Z, that are the largest neurons in your brain, uh, up to 100 micrometers in diameter, which is pretty lush for human hair. Again, a sarcomere is just over two microns and the average hair might be 50 or so. And so when you're seeing this, this diameter of 100 micrometers in these bet cells, that's pretty huge. Um, and again, you don't need to know, you know specifically bet cells, but, but you do need to know upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons and alpha and gamma motor neurons, but we'll get to those later. For now, it's upper motor neurons and lower. And upper, that's in your central nervous system. And then the lower motor neurons, those are in your peripheral nervous system. Now the interaction between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron happens at the ventral horn or the anterior horn or ventral root. It's called a bunch of things you'll see. 
Um, but that's, it's just a front, uh, the upper and lower motor neurons, they synapse at the front of your spine. And then those lower motor uh, neurons, they leave the spine and head out toward a tissue. This is why it's considered the peripheral nervous system. Uh, and the, the lower motor neurons are in the periphery, right? They're relaying uh, the message from the CNS, from an upper motor neuron out toward, in this case, an arm or a leg, an ab, right? Some sort of muscle. This is muscle physiology. We're going to talk about muscle uh, recruitment. And it, there isn't a single neuron that activates a single muscle fiber. Motor control isn't that segregated. Each motor neuron controls a lot of fibers. Uh, and when one neuron fires, lots of fibers are called to action. Uh, some of those actions are very isolated, but there's teamwork in your neurons. They're integrated in a way that you do like reach and grab uh, as one coordinated neural activity. And this is where some of those other motor areas can assist with planning and execution. Uh, but the primary motor cortex is the most important slab of brain for muscle action. You'll see maps uh, of where particular body areas are controlled. Uh, pictures like this are called the motor homunculus, homunculus means little person in, in Latin. It's not a perfect representation though, or even a good representation in part, if someone experiences damage that causes paralysis, or if there's some amputation, you can see shifting of motor areas. But beyond that, it's way more scattered than these maps indicate. Uh, it's almost like what people say about taste buds. If you if you've heard this map described, you know this is the you know part of your mouth where you taste sweet. Uh, over here is sour, and you know, bitter is at the back of the tongue, and salty is at the tip, or you know, all whatever. It's, it's all nonsense. Uh, the homunculus map has a comparable amount of sense. It's real, um, but it's a lot more scattered and sloppy than the diagram suggests. And there's overlap in areas too. Getting into the premotor cortex, this is in the frontal lobe, just in front of the primary motor cortex. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than it than it looks like in this map, but the the neurons aren't as big. There's no huge bet cells in here. Um, lots of important roles though: preparation of movement uh, and responses to external stimuli, you know, sensory guided uh, motion. So, like if people have lesions here, what really seems to be impaired is their planning of movement, uh, which happens before the motion. So. Activity in the premotor cortex tends to precede activity in the primary motor cortex. Um, the premotor cortex might fire, you know, a tenth of a second before the action begins. The supplementary motor area, this green space here, um, also planning of movement. Uh, there's overlap between these brain areas, and the supplementary motor area has roles in motor learning uh, in addition to that the posterior parietal complex. This is in the parietal lobe, uh, top of the brain behind the frontal lobe. Uh, it seems to help with sensory motor, uh, like visual motor transformation. So like if I say catch and I, I throw something in your direction, this area of the brain is going to be activated. Uh, so those are the brain regions. The most important one for you to know is the primary motor cortex just also know that it's supported by other areas. Uh, and, and getting back to the nerves, uh, remember that there are upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. The upper neurons are in the um, cortex and brain stem. That's where those live. Uh, but just think of them as, as being in the primary motor cortex. And then their axons um, descend down the spine and they synapse with a lower motor neuron or an interneuron, but let's keep it simple and just say that upper motor neurons begin in your brain, travel down the spine, and synapse with a lower motor neuron. Um, 
And then the upper motor neurons activate the lower neurons using glutamate. That's the neurotransmitter they use uh, to, to depolarize, to activate the uh, lower motor neurons. And those lower motor uh, neurons, those depolarize muscles with, with acetylcholine, not glutamate. So upper to lower, that's glutamate lower to muscle, that's acetylcholine, but we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Uh, so alpha motor nerves, these are, are voluntary lower motor nerves. They're cell bodies that are actually in the CNS, the central nervous system, but their axons innervate extrafusal fibers, meaning the fibers you can voluntarily contract. We'll talk more about that, but for now, um, extrafusal as opposed to intrafusal muscle fibers, which are innervated by um, gamma motor neurons. And gamma motor neurons have diameters of about five micrometers, they're tiny, just a couple of sarcomeres in diameter, tiny, tiny nerves. Uh, but we'll talk more about extra and intrafusal fibers in a future lecture. Um, but for now, extrafusal is voluntary, Intrafusal is involuntary. And you have beta motor nerves too, which innervate both uh, intrafusal and extrafusal, but not many of these. And for the sake of this class, we'll just ignore them. Uh, now, the peripheral nervous system is, is not just uh, like receiving messages from the CNS, it's transmitting messages too. Um, so, so efferent or motor information exits from the ventral horn or ventral root and afferent or sensory information enters the dorsal horn or dorsal root. Uh, here you can see uh, some motor neurons exiting the ventral root and, and extending toward muscle fibers. Uh, before we talk about that, how that innervation works, um, we have a couple of terms to define. The first is a motor unit. This is a motor neuron and every single muscle fiber that neuron innervates, both of those, that's a motor unit. Um, one neuron might activate a thousand fibers. Uh, you know, each muscle fiber is innervated uh, by a single motor neuron, not several, but each motor neuron innervates multiple muscle fibers. And the muscle fibers that belong to one motor unit aren't often immediate neighbors. Uh, as you can see in the diagram on the right, the, the fibers activated by a motor neuron aren't usually adjacent. They're scattered throughout the muscle's girth. Um, and the second term is the all or none principle. What this means is that if a motor neuron fires, all the fibers in that motor unit will contract, uh, not just some of them, but all of them, and they'll contract as hard as they possibly can. A, a huge stimulus does not make them contract harder, right? Either 100% of the fibers in that motor unit contract maximally, or 0% of them contract at all. Those are the only two options. It's not like a light switch that has a dimmer where you can control the brightness. Um, it's either on or it's off. That's how motor units work. Uh, now, nerve excitement is an electrical event. Um, it's controlled by the movement of ions. An ion is just an, an atom, or it could be multiple atoms. Uh, it has a charge, right? Positive or negative. An anion is negatively charged. A cation is positively charged. And the manipulation of charges is how neurons work. It's also how batteries work, the manipulation of charges. That's how batteries work. Um, if you've ever put batteries into a remote or any other device, you'll notice that they have a plus sign and a minus sign. And when you insert the batteries, you have to orient them according to those positive and negative terminals. Because um, inside the batteries, there's a separation of charges. Uh, and the batteries die when the negative charge is done moving. Uh, neurons have separations of charges too. Inside the neuron and outside, uh, in the 
extracellular fluid, there are differences in concentrations of ions, sodium and potassium being the two that we're interested in now at the moment. We'll get to some other ions later, but uh, sodium is really high outside the neuron and potassium is really high inside. Uh, and it takes active transport, it takes ATP, uh, to move ions against their concentration gradients. Uh, there's an ATP ACE enzyme here uh, that's powering the exchange, that's shoving the sodium outside and the potassium pulling it inside. Uh, so that's how uh, we can recharge our batteries, our, our you know neurons. Uh, now, these are both positively charged. Sodium and potassium are both cations, uh, but they're stored in different concentrations, and that uneven distribution results in a separation of charges. Uh, so in other words, there's a voltage difference inside and outside of the neuron, and an action potential, which is the firing of that neuron, is the um, inverting of that voltage. Uh, the, the inside becomes positively charged relative to the outside. That's an action potential. Now, this is the classic action potential diagram for a neuron. Resting membrane potential is shown to be negative 70 millivolts, uh, which means a charge inside of the cell at rest is about 70 millivolts lower than the charge outside of the cell. Um, if some sodium, which is positively charged comes in and all other properties are held constant, uh, the negative charge of that cell will diminish a bit. Uh, this is depolarization, that's what it's called. Uh, returning to its resting potential is called repolarization and making it even more negative is called hyperpolarization. This is all in reference to the cell being, quote, polarized, uh, meaning there's a difference in potential across the cell's membrane. The voltage is lower inside, so it's polarized. If you depolarize, you eliminate that. Repolarize, you reestablish polarization. Hyperpolarize, make it even more uh, polarized. Now, the values shown here, um, are about neurons, but not really motor neurons. Uh, these values aren't consistent across all neuron types. Uh, pretty much all animal cells, uh, regardless of whether they're excitable, have a resting membrane potential. It's not just neurons. Your red blood cells have a tiny negative charge, 10, negative 10 millivolts or so. Um, smooth muscle cells are negative 50 to negative 60 millivolts. Um, skeletal muscle cells, much more negative, negative 85 to negative 95 uh, millivolts. Um, in some cell types, resting potential is sort of a poor term because they're constantly changing. In others, you can get a pretty good uh, measurement. Neurons um, tend to be, you know, a bit more negative than smooth muscle, you know, negative 65 to negative 70 on average, somewhere around there, uh, but it's not consistent across all neurons. Um, that said, let's just use this diagram. And so if you get a small excitement, a small influx of sodium, uh, that influx, if it, if it reaches negative 55 millivolts, um, a, a 15 millivolt jump, the voltage gated ion channels open. And these channels are membrane proteins uh, that are sensitive to charge gradients. Um, and at, at resting potential, they're closed. Uh, when they open, sodium rushes in uh, and, and moving according to its concentration gradient, right? Sodium is positively charged. So that makes it positive inside the neuron. And that electrical spike, that positivity, that is your action potential. Uh, but you have to reach that gate threshold for this to happen. Uh, lots of tiny stimuli, tiny excitements aren't sufficient to depolarize the nerve. Th think of the nerve as like it's being whispered to. If the whisper isn't loud enough, it doesn't interpret the message. 
Uh, but if the whisper gets louder and louder and louder, eventually it'll hear it and it will make sense of that message and be inspired into action. Um, so it's like an audiology test. Yeah, a set of instructions, but it's super quiet and then less quiet and then less quiet and then less quiet until you can finally hear it. And once you can, you leap into action, you leap into action potential. Um, uh, but following that action potential, there's a refractory period, a refractory period in the same way that your hearing would be terrible briefly after a really loud noise. Um, during that period, if someone wants to get your attention, they need to whisper really loud. And so that's sort of how a refractory period uh, works. And this is what those voltage-gated sodium channels look like, kind of. They're, they're, they're embedded in the cell membrane. And uh, when the channels open, they're activated. And then very quickly, uh, they switch to their inactivated shape. And when they're inactivated, they're unable to be reopened. Uh, no matter how excitatory the stimulus, they cannot do it. They cannot be reopened. Um, this absolute inability to reopen um, is when the potassium channels open and potash, uh, potassium rushes out of the cell and that repolarize it, uh, returning to its negative charge uh, and then the voltage-gated sodium channels transition to their closed, potentially active state. Uh, there's a difference between the absolute refractory period and a relative refractory period. The absolute refractory period is while the neuron is positively charged, right? The sodium channels will not reopen. Uh, but then enough potassium leaks out and you can refire the nerve uh, at that point. It's just harder uh, because too much potassium has leaked out. So it's even more negative than its resting potential. Um, the excitatory stimulus to, to reach that gate threshold is no longer you know 15 or so millivolts. Maybe now it's 30 or 35 millivolts. You need that big of a jump. Um, a bigger, louder stimulus is required to activate them. So that's the relative refractory period. Uh, but eventually it recovers. Uh, it gets back to its normal resting potential. Uh, those sodium potassium pumps do their job and it gets back to that, let's just call it negative 70. Uh, this is a look at the timing of action potential. Sodium rushes in quickly. Uh, within a millisecond, the neuron's charge is positive. Uh, potassium conductance, this isn't as quick. I mean, it's fast, but it's not as fast. Um, so the absolute refractory period, that's going to be between one and two milliseconds. Um, but, but the muscle contraction that follows, that might last 15 to 100 milliseconds. Um, so the contraction period is much longer than the refractory period. If you fire a motor neuron every three to four milliseconds, you're not going to see like a strobe light effect in motor control. It's not going to be quivering at, at a high frequency. You'll get a steady contraction uh, because that effect lingers longer than the nerve impulse. Um, as long as you're getting those impulses to the muscle steadily enough, you'll contract smoothly. Uh, it, it's not going to relax between each stimulus. Now, the heart behaves uh, differently. Uh, even if the relative refractory period in skeletal muscle, let's say it lasts five milliseconds before it gets recruited again. It's nothing compared to the heart, uh, which has, you know, it's about a quarter of a second or so, the, the refractory period. Um, so once you have an action potential, it gets sent to the target tissue, in this case, skeletal muscle, and it's transmitted through myelinated nerves. Uh, this is called saltatory conduction uh, the signal leaps from node to node. Uh, they're called uh, nodes of Ranvier, uh, Ranvier, whatever. Um, gaps between the myelin sheaths, right? L little patches where it's not insulated. And this is where action potentials can be generated. Uh, the 
thickness of the myelin sheath varies uh, between nerves. Uh, the larger the diameter of the myelin, the faster the conduction, the nerve conduction. And this is something we'll talk about in future lectures, uh, both with efferent uh, and afferent signals. For now, though, uh, just know that some nerves send their impulses at the pace of walking and others go at the speed of Ferraris. And the thickness of the myelin sheath is what determines those differences in, in uh, velocity. Uh, now, Schwann cells are what form the myelin. Uh, each Schwann, Schwann cell covers about 100 or so micrometers of an axon. Um, so a long nerve will have thousands of these. Uh, and there are lots of conditions that are going to impair Schwann cells, including like leprosy. And, and if these conditions will affect nerve transmission because myelin is critical um, to, to conduction velocity. And now a recurring theme in all of these lectures is variance. Nerves vary in thickness, uh, both axon diameter and myelin layers both. How layered is the myelin and how thick is the axon? Both of these things vary. So here's a glimpse at some diameters, right? Alpha fibers on the left, gamma fibers on the right. Uh, nothing you need to memorize here, but, but if you look at the diameter in micrometers of an alpha fiber uh, at the node of Ranvier, uh, you'll see an average of about three um, in the peripheral nervous system and about 3.3 in the central nervous system compared to a gamma fiber, which is just under half of that thickness at each of those sites. So nerves vary uh, without memorizing any numbers. Those differences in general will become important in future lectures. Uh, in lecture four, last lecture, we talked about where your strength comes from and you know what explains it. We're going to add a couple of additional explanations. Um, so in the last lecture, we said the number of muscle fibers you recruit partly determines force output. Um, but what determines the number of muscle fibers is the number of motor neurons that are excited. Uh, so that's sort of the same explanation, uh, although it'll get a little bit more complicated in, in upcoming lectures. But another factor uh, that determines force output is called rate coding. And this is the frequency of achieving an action potential, uh, the duration of inter-spike intervals. Uh, so if you increase the load on the muscle, uh, you'll increase the firing rate of the motor neurons, um, the number of action potentials in a second or a you know, given duration. Uh, so with a refractory period of one to two milliseconds, the behavior of the muscle you know, has not sufficiently relaxed when the next stimulus comes in. Um, you haven't put all the calcium away and unbound the cross bridges yet. That takes time. And the more rapid your action potentials are, that results in more uh, a, a stronger muscle contraction. Uh, but uh, there are uh, some more steps between the depolarization of the motor neuron, the action potential in a motor neuron, and the contraction of the muscle fiber itself. There's a neuromuscular junction where the nerve meets the muscle, and that's what we'll talk about in the next lecture. But for this one, here are the questions that you should be able to answer. If you review these and think about what we talked about, you should be able to answer these. And in lecture six, uh, we'll finish what's called excitation contraction coupling. I will see you then.